everyone. My name is Jennifer Wilson, and I am the executive director of Cassium Friends. And I'm really excited to welcome everyone here today for what I hope, and I actually I success, suspect will be one of the most useful and life-changing webinars that we have offered to date. And that's because that we know all too well that the pain and fears surrounding needles of any kind, from home injections to IVs to blood draws, can cause considerable pain and be traumatizing, not just for the child, but for everyone involved. So if you are here tonight in anticipation of starting injections or really struggling, um, I just wanna share that the good news is that um, we have some amazing help here to try and turn that story around. Today, we're partnering with an organization called Solution for Kids in Pain. And their mission is exactly that, to empower kids and families with evidence-based solutions for children's pain. And what does that mean? That means putting everything we know and have learned from research right into the hands of kids, families, and clinical practitioners um, so that you can have these strategies available to you to help you and your family in the clinic, at the lab, and in your homes. I just wanted to quickly thank our sponsors before we got started as well. Um, in partnership with the Arthritis Society, Nicola Wealth Management, Abvi, Amgen, and Sobe, we're able to keep working towards our vision of a pain-free future for kids. And while we work on that vision through our research programs at Cassium Friends, which are donor support, we're also building out uh, extensive resources to help kids and families like yours manage pain and um, really just cope and have the best experience you can um, managing chronic disease at home. So one of those resources is our virtual education library filled with really every topic that is in important, that families have told us matter to them or that they struggle with. Um, and there you're not just going to find expert information like this talk here, but you're also going to find the real experiences of patients. Um, so stories, you're going to find indexed questions and answers from parents, tips from youth, and also templates that you can use uh, for school with coaches. And these are all resources that have been co-created between healthcare and families. So um, we're really excited about the wealth of information and I really encourage everyone to visit our website at cassiumfriends.ca on any issue um, that you're currently facing. Um, I also wanted to um, just really highlight that your experience is so valuable. And so I'm really excited to introduce everyone here in the room today, um, we have over 52 cities represented across Canada, as well as five countries uh, around the world uh, attending this webinar here today. So we always try and get started by encouraging everyone to introduce themselves uh, using the chat function, share whatever you're comfortable with. You could share your child's age, diagnosis, where you live. Um, and because my favorite tried and true distraction technique um, is ice cream, we also, we're gonna encourage everyone to share your favorite flavor of ice cream. And I've asked our speakers as well. Um, we're not only meeting each other here tonight, but we also have the opportunity to keep the conversation going. So Cassian Friends has created a private Facebook group. It's called Juvenile Arthritis Canada. And there you can connect with, well, you can see 412 members across Canada. Um, these are parents. And we know that, of course, the nurses and your pediatric rheumatology teams are your main source of information, but there's really something about being connected to other parents who just get it, who can offer tips and strategies or just listen. So I hope everyone will take the time to uh, join the Juvenile Arthritis Canada Facebook group today. So before I introduce the speakers, I just wanted to mention a few upcoming events. Um, first of all, is right after this session, you will receive a survey, and we really, really hope that you'll take the time to fill that survey out as we are in planning for our next uh, 2023 season of virtual education, and your input is really what helps us provide the best information uh, and sessions that we can that fill your needs. There's also going to be a whole list of injection support resources that um, you can keep on hand in follow-up from this event, so watch your email for that. We also have Team Cassium Friends is in full effect across the country right now. We just had um, some amazing runners in Halifax uh, and Ottawa the last couple weekends. Um, Vancouver race is coming up. And then through the fall, we have London, Edmonton, 
Toronto and more. So uh, Team Cassie and Friends is our main fundraising um, event of the year. And it's a really great way to raise awareness, get involved. And there's a lot of times when a child's rheumatic disease can feel very helpless or hopeless or helpless, but this is something we found that we can do together. And it's been making a real difference in terms of Cassie and Friends being able to work across the country with kids, families, and healthcare teams. Um, the last is we have some pretty exciting youth programming mm -hmm. underway. We just held a really amazing youth vision session uh, last weekend. And um, some of the programs that we'll be launching are a youth mentorship program and a youth ambassador program. So we hope you'll watch out for those as well. Um, lastly, one of the highlights of summer um, for many families in our community is the Arthritis Society camps. So we have all of the dates that camps are running on the screen there. And we really encourage you, if you haven't yet, um, to visit the Arthritis Society's website and uh, register for camp. Um, the youth that have gone to camp uh, just can't speak highly enough about it. And we're really excited and thankful for this opportunity. Uh, lastly, if you have a question anytime during the session, there is at the bottom of your screen a Q&A a button. Um, so you can just enter your questions in there. At the end of the presentation, we're going to bring all of the presenters on live together and address all of the questions. Um, so please feel free to ask a question or enter a question on the Q&A button at any time. So now I have the pleasure of uh, introducing a really incredible trio um, who are here to share their wealth of knowledge uh, and each of whom are incredibly passionate about helping kids and families with needle fears and pain. So first up, we have Katie Burney. Katie is here with us from SCIP, or Solutions for Kids in Pain, which I introduced earlier. Um, she's also assistant professor at the University of Calgary and a clinical psychologist at the Alberta, Alberta Children's Hospital. Um, in addition to those amazing credentials, Katie is often referred to as a disruptor in the field of children's pain and recently won a Canadian Pain Award to recognize her outstanding achievements in pain research and management. She's also particularly familiar with the challenges of families in pediatric rheumatology as she worked closely in her clinical practice with the rheumatology team at Alberta Children's Hospital. We also have Dr. Megan McMurtry joining us from the University of Guelph. Megan is an international leader in creating guidelines around how needle fears and chronic pain in children are supported and addressed in medical practices around the world. She's also done incredible work to ensure vaccine safety and raise awareness about the very real challenges of needle fear during COVID-19 and is also a published columnist in the New York Times. And I forgot, I was gonna tell you their favorite ice cream flavor. So um, Megan's is mint chocolate chip and Katie's is strawberry. And um, next up is Caitlin Constantine. And Caitlin is our third speaker who's joining us here today. And she is a graduate student who works alongside Dr. Megan McMurtry at the University of Guelph. Um, I get really excited when um, I met Caitlin and I hear her passion for improving needle related experiences for kids and families, because I know that having bright minds like hers um, at the graduate level interested in pediatric rheumatology is really what's gonna make an ultimate difference for our community. Um, her, her favorite ice cream is cookies and cream. And with that, I am very excited to welcome Katie, Megan, and Caitlin to turn on their cameras and start their presentation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jennifer. So as uh, Caitlin gets our slides up here, I just wanna say welcome to the workshop. We're so pleased that you're here with us and uh, you will hear, I think our passion come through about needle fear and managing uh, needle fear um, for young people and actually people across the lifespan as well. Um, so before we get started, I just have a couple of sort of housekeeping items I want to go over. Um, so, you know, because two of us are psychologists and one of us is a psychologist in training, I have to say that this isn't therapy. Um, today, this is an educational workshop, right? So um, we're not providing psychological treatment or healthcare advice for a particular individual, but are taking the best evidence that, that we know of from the research literature and also from our clinical practice and providing it to you today. 
Um, so our main audience, right, you know who you are, um, you're caregivers of young people with rheumatological conditions. So there may be some young people also in the audience today. Um, the information should still be useful to you, but really this workshop is geared towards parents. We probably would have spun it a little bit differently um, uh, for the young people. And for those of you who are afraid of needles, um, there won't be any pictures of needles during our workshop today, okay? But we will be talking, of course, about needles um, and also steps kind of leading up to a needle procedure. So just a little bit of a warning on that, probably expected though. So next slide, please. So today we're gonna talk about a lot of things. Um, and so we've mapped it out here on the slide. We're gonna talk about fear and what it means to be afraid. We're going to cover tools to help with kind of the lower to moderate levels of fear and pain and fainting, which can happen for some people um, when they're getting a needle. We're going to then talk about what helps with high fear um, and the most important uh, tool being um, facing our fear or what we can call a graduated exposure. Um, we're going to put all this together to make a plan. Um, Katie's going to talk to us about dealing with anticipatory nausea towards the end. We'll, we'll wrap up with some resources and then we're going to have that Q&A um, session that Jennifer spoke about. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie for the next couple of slides. Awesome. <clears throat> thanks so much, Megan, and thanks to Jennifer and Cassie and friends uh, for having us here this evening and looking forward to the question and answers with all of you as well. Um, we just also want to touch on what are we not going to talk about, because uh, we think that's just as important as what we are going to talk about. Um, as psychologists, you know, there are different decisions around types of injections you might be getting, um, or how kind of the very practical components of, you know, how to um, put the medication in a needle or the injection technique itself. So those are just things that we're not going to address that we know that um, often within rheumatolo rheumatology clinics, um, or other care, those are best covered by nurse educators um, and others within the clinic as well. And it's just kind of beyond scope of what we often touch on as psychologists. So we're really gonna focus on how do you deal with those needle fears? How do you deal with needle pain? Um, and how do you deal with um, uh, side effects such as anticipatory nausea that come with certain medications? Um, but there's lots of information there as well as uh, at your uh, clinics where you're followed um, for some specific uh, around um, injection. The other things we just won't touch on today, um, uh, sorry, needle procedures across the lifespan, what are they used for? I covered that stuff. Um, lots of different things, right? So many of you uh, know this, they're covered um, to diagnose or rule out certain medical conditions, so they can play a really important role there. Um, they're often really important to protect oneself, or to prevent the spread of infectious diseases, such as uh, vaccinations, immunizations. Um, they can provide medication for treatment, often the case uh, in, in a different rheumatological condition. So it could be injections, could be um, IVs or infusions uh, that might require um, needles to obtain medication. And they can also be used to monitor response to treatment. So blood draws, right, that we might need to look at different markers within the blood of um, how much medication someone's getting or what impact it might be having on immune response or other responses within the body. So there are a variety um, of injections that some of you or your kids may be dealing with over the course of a rheumatological condition um, or other things such as injection, right? If you uh, needed to injection or a steroid injection um, from anything like that, that could be another example. So we are gonna touch on um, you know, these strategies all apply to all of these uh, different types of uh, needle procedures. Um, so they're all relevant to our conversation today. Excellent. So next slide, please, Caitlin. So um, Katie just talked to us about how common needles are, right? So what you may not know is actually um, having some fear of needles is really, really, really common across the lifespan. This is not just a childhood issue. This is not just in healthy kids or children with chronic illnesses. This is an everybody um, issue. And so um, we often don't talk about it though, right? Um, and when we do talk about it, we hear things like, well, you know, needles are just a little poke. Who cares about this? 
Um, and that really is unfortunate, that kind of language, because it makes people feel maybe ashamed to come forward when the truth is this stuff is really common. So about two out of every three children um, have some level of fear of needles, and about one in every four adults have some fear too. But we know that there's different amounts of fear, right? So we can think about fear along the spectrum um, from sort of low to um, or none to low to moderate or medium amount to really high. So I want you to think about kind of how you feel about needles um, and how your children feel about needles and think about where you are on that spectrum. Next slide. So about one in every 10 individuals has a very high level of fear. So for these individuals, it's really hard for them to undergo needle procedures. So they may actually be really anxious and probably are very, really anxious before, long before the needle. So they actually want to avoid it, right? Because anxiety leads to avoidance. And if they do go through the, with the procedure, they're gonna have, experience a lot of distress and they may even try to escape the situation because that's natural when we're experiencing um, a really fearful response. So needles are important as Katie um, provided that overview, but we also know that some medical um, procedures like needles can be seen as traumatic by those who are experiencing them. So the really important thing here is that the scariness of the procedure is actually really in the eye of the beholder rather than how severe the procedure is based on other people's opinions, right? So that idea about needles just being a little poke really isn't relevant if you're the one who's undergoing the needle and you are very scared, right? So most people who have a high level um, or high fear of needles say they had a negative experience in the past, like being held down right, for the procedure. So we're here today to talk about how to help with needle fear across the spectrum from low to high, okay? Um, but first, before we get into more tools, we're gonna learn a little bit more about um, what fear is. So I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin. Great, thank you. So hi everyone, I'll be walking us through, um, talking about more about what is feeling afraid. Um, and so to answer this question, I'd really like you all to think about something that kind of frightens you. So maybe it's bugs or heights or public speaking. And so as you think about this, consider what does it feel like in your body? What do you think you would, would happen if you were to face the thing that scares you? Maybe what thoughts or words would be going through your mind? And in that situation, what would you want to do? So when we're afraid, we can usually feel it in our body. So our heart maybe starts to race. Maybe we have butterflies in our stomach. We feel sweaty. Maybe our breathing speeds up. And we tend to think that something bad will happen. And when we're afraid, we get what we call a fight, flight, or freeze response. And so we either maybe want to run away from the thing that we're afraid of, or we want to defend ourselves against it, or sometimes we're so afraid that we're kind of paralyzed by that fear. And so when we're faced with something that scares us, our automatic, um, we have this automatic response with biolog biological changes. And so we don't tend to feel this way intentionally, and it's usually outside of our conscious awareness. And an important thing to keep in mind with fear is that it's unique to each person. And so fear is individual and what scares one person is not necessarily scary for another person. So for example, I'm really afraid of clowns and I'm sure many of you here are probably not afraid of clowns. So fear is a normal emotion that we feel when we are in danger or when we think that we're in danger. And so all of our emotions, they serve a purpose. So they have a job and fear is kind of like our body's emergency alarm system that tells us when we might be in danger. So it's helpful to feel scared when we are in real danger, like seeing a bear, our body gets ready, ready maybe to run away or to conserve our energy by staying still and quiet and waiting for that bear to pass. So just like with a fire alarm, it's helpful to ring when there is a fire, when there is a danger there. 
but it's not so helpful to feel scared if there is no danger or there's nothing that can hurt you or nothing really bad is likely to happen. But the thing is our body can be really bad at differentiating when we are in real danger versus when we're not. And some people have a really sensitive body alarm system that goes off at any small sign of danger. And they can feel afraid when there's no real danger or they feel more afraid than they need to be. So it's kind of like a false alarm, sort of like when a fire alarm rings from burnt toast or taking a really hot shower. And so that can happen with needles too. So we've talked about most people don't really like getting needles. A lot of people are, are, have some fear of needles, um, but being really, really afraid can get in the way of getting needles and it makes getting needles harder. And it can also generalize to other fears too. So some people might start to also fear just going to a doctor's appointment or going to a hospital. So since fear is useful in some situations, so we're not trying to get rid of fear or that alarm system. We have it for a reason, but instead through practice that we'll be talking about today, we can rewire that system so that it, it's working in a way that's more helpful for us. And so we'll talk a lot about that today. Um, but first we're going to talk about ways to help when someone has a little bit of fear. So Megan talked about how there's different levels of fear that we can experience. So some people have a little bit of fear, some people have a medium amount, some people have a lot. And for the next few um, slides, we'll talk about people who have low to more medium level of fear and what can help. And so it's a natural reaction to have some fear um, from getting a needle. It can be normal given that needles poke our, our skin and our body generally doesn't like that. And so it's common for people to sometimes be afraid of pain from the needle or sometimes feeling faint or dizzy. And there can be other fears too. Um, but the good news is that we know quite a lot about how to help with pain, feeling dizzy or fainting, um, and generally general kind of upset from needles. And so we'll go over those tools next. And here is a summary that um, of, of all the tools that can help with the low to medium levels of fear. And they're separated based on when you might use the tools. So for example, um, before, during, and after the needle. And we'll cover those in more detail. So I'll just go over them quickly here. Um, but before the needle, um, one of the first steps to, that can be helpful is to learn about fear and pain. And another big part with preparing for the needle is to talk about the procedure and what to expect. Making a plan is also a good idea to do before the procedure. And this can include tools that we go over today. During the needle, there are a lot of things that can be done. It's like using numbing cream, sitting um, upright unless fainting is a concern and using distraction. We'll also talk about what words to try and say um, and what words to avoid during the needle. And finally, we'll also talk about muscle tension, um, which can be used um, if dizziness or fainting happens, as well as relaxing your body during a needle, which we'll cover a bit later on. After the needle is done, talking about what went well and using rewards can really help um, your child feel good about getting through the needle. And it also helps them remember it in a positive or maybe a neutral way. So um, next, um, Megan will lead us through learning about pain. Thanks, Caitlin. So when talking about needles, we need to talk about pain as well, um, because as we know, and what Caitlin has shared, um, needles can hurt. Um, and there, it is really the focus of a lot of fears that um, children have uh, around needles. There can, of course, be other fears as well. So pain is just super complex. Um, so it's very subjective, which means just like fear, um, it feels different for everyone, right? What someone is going to experience pain from may be very different from somebody else. So I just wanna give you an example to illustrate the model that we have up here, which is the biopsychosocial model, which really means that there are psychological factors, social factors, and biological factors that influence the amount of pain that we experience. And pain can also actually influence um, some of those factors as well. 
So I want you to imagine um, that I'm walking out my um, front door in the morning and I'm a bit klutzy and so I um, trip and I sprain my ankle. So I tear three ligaments in my ankle. And I had just been on my way into work. Okay, so that's situation A. In situation B, I want you to imagine that instead of the recreation soccer game that I played last night, that I was playing in the World Cup um, of soccer. Um, and in, you know what? No, I'm going to say Roland Garros is on right now for tennis. So let's go with the with the French Open. Let's do that instead. Imagine I'm playing at Roland Garros and like the 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 center court playing tennis. Um, really important match for my career. And I go to slide to hit a forehand back, and my ankle wobbles, and I again tear three ligaments. So the amount of injury in both cases is the same, right? The, the three torn ligaments. And often when we talk about pain, we act as if then the amount of pain someone is going to experience is going to be the same in situation A, me just walking up my front steps and tearing my ankle um, versus situation B. But research has told us it's really not that simple and that these psychological, social, and biological factors really can influence the amount of pain that we experience. So I won't take longer um, to go into that, although I feel like I could talk about that for, for endless amounts of time. Um, but this matters because one thing that tends to affect how much pain we experience is fear. So next slide, please. So we know that pain and fear are often related and children who are afraid of needles tend to report feeling more pain from a needle. Um, and this sort of quite negative cycle can develop, which is understandable, but is something that we would like to avoid, right? So um, when we think we're in danger, um, as Caitlin has reviewed, our body becomes sort of more aware, it becomes hypervigilant, it's like ready to fight, flight, freeze, um, and we're more concerned also about things that may harm us. So if I'm worried about getting a needle, I start thinking something bad's gonna happen, I'm feeling scared, I get that body preparation going. If I have the needle, I'm going to probably experience more needle pain, which then of course, in the future, I'm gonna be more worried about having my next needle, right? Um, and so this really can create this quite negative cycle. Next slide, please. So the good news is that given this biopsychosocial model of pain, and that we know all these different kinds of factors can influence the pain experience, um, you know, for example, and if I was playing in um, the French Open, there'd be millions of people watching me play, right, and sprain my ankle versus walking out of um, my, you know, out of my front door and, and spraining my ankle on the front steps, right? Social context, very different. Psychological factors, we've just talked about fear. Which situation would fear be greater in, right? Um, biological factors, right? So genetics, certainly age, um, you know, birth sex, all of these things can, um, can matter. So the good news is that given our experience with pain is so um, affected by so many factors, this means that there's lots of ways that we can intervene, right? Um, and so this figure actually shows us um, the tools that can help with pain. Um, and it's really just a different way to organize it um, than Caitlin had presented it before. And so we're going to go over each of these um, strategies next. So first, um, if we go to the next slide, uh, starting with preparing for the needle, um, we need to understand, and the young person needs to understand why they're even getting the needle, right? There needs to be information provided even before the procedure. And oftentimes, um, parents may want to just sort of let it be and not provide a lot of information. But the problem is that, um, if children don't know, if young people don't know, or even adults don't know the answers, um, we may leave those to our own imagination. And then that could involve thinking about everything that could go wrong and kind of the worst case scenarios, right? So we want to be adequately prepared. Now, explaining in advance what the procedure is going to involve is important, but you may not have all of that information. So you may need to connect with your rheumatology um, team to get some of this information. So we've provided some information on the slide here and I'll go through it, but there are differences depending on your child's age or developmental level. 
So how you would prepare or explain a procedure to a four-year-old is clearly not the same as you would for a 12-year-old or even you know, a 17-year-old, for example. So the level of information provided needs to be tailored um, to your child's developmental stage and also their temperament. Keeping in mind that the more anxious we are, the more information we tend to feel like we want, right? Um, and so it's important also to ask what information your child actually wants to know, right? Um, but we've provided some general guidance. So first explaining why the needle is even needed, okay? Um, then describing the procedure in concrete terms. So you can imagine as if this was like a movie and you had to almost script out and create a scene, right? So how long is the, the procedure going to take? Who's going to be there and what are they going to be doing? What medical equipment will be used and why, right? Um, and then what might your young person um, feel, hear, smell and see kind of around them? Um, and it's also helpful to go over um, tools that they can use to cope. So it's not just they're having this procedure, but also that um, here are the things that we're going to do to make it um, more comfortable for you. And so a lot of our presentation today will be talking about um, those tools. And we'll talk about putting together a plan all together um, towards the end. So next slide covers topical anesthetics. And they are medicines that are put on the skin to numb the place um, where the needle is being inserted. So topicals um, need to be applied ahead of time, typically between 30 and 60 minutes, and it depends on um, the particular um, formulation. So you need to check the product um, instructions. Sometimes they come in a patch, um, or if it's in a tube of cream, you can actually wrap the area with plastic wrap afterwards. So it does need to be applied to the right area. So you might need to find out more information about that. Um, and it's really important for the young person to know that they may still feel or they will still feel pressure um, if anyone kind of puts pressure um, on, on that location. So it doesn't numb all sensation, um, but it certainly does reduce pain. Um, and it can actually be used for all ages. And this is something they're often really underutilized um, and they can be actually purchased at pharmacies, um, typically without a prescription um, in Canada, although there may be some differences um, by province. In the US, it definitely differs um, by state. And I'll turn it over to Katie for the next few slides. Thanks so much, Megan. Some of the other things that you can do that are really helpful during um, the needle procedure itself include things like positioning. So oftentimes when we think about school age kids, it's sitting upright um, and gently holding the child. Um, uh, that can include things like um, even with younger children sitting facing you almost in a hug, right? So that the arm or whatever the injection is, that space is there or side sitting. Um, on your lap and you can gently hold them or they could even be sitting beside you. Um, the idea here is that it's actually better to be sitting up as opposed to lying down for the most part, unless you have a history of fainting, in which case we'll talk about a separate procedure uh, or supports uh, or strategies for that. But the general idea is um, we feel more comfortable, more confident um, when we're sitting up uh, as opposed to lying down and, and really avoiding being held down or holding a child down for any needle procedures. Um, and generally when that's happening, it's generally because there's distress uh, and all of the strategies we're gonna continue to talk about today are a better way to manage distress um, and are likely to lead to improved outcomes and decreased distress over time. Um, if we're holding down or restraining a child, that can actually increase distress and fear uh, over time as opposed to make it better. And in some cases actually be quite traumatic for the child as well as for parents and family members or healthcare professionals as well. You'll often find um, asking you if they, they have a preference of whether they would like to look and watch the needle procedure or whether they would like to look away. Um, so just be aware, both are fine, just kind of whatever is most comfortable for the, the child. Um, and usually they'll be quite good at, at telling you. Um, and whenever possible, just setting up a quiet and calm environment, whether that's in the home or whether it's in a clinic, um, you know, trying to have that space that is a private, quiet uh, and as calm as possible.
One of the other strategies that is particularly helpful uh, for pain management is distraction. You'll see that this strategy um, alone is, is not sufficient when you have higher levels of needle fears. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, but what we know is distraction is actually the most widely studied approach um, uh, from a psychological uh, strategy for needle pain management um, for any type of needle procedure. And basically the way distraction works is your brain can only pay attention to so much. So if it's really focused on something interesting and engaging and interactive, um, your brain is actually less likely to perceive any sort of um, information as painful, like when they get the needle procedure. You can use distraction before, while you're waiting, you can use it during, um, and you can use it after. Uh, so the idea of a good distractor, like I mentioned, it should be engaging, so it stimulate as many senses as possible, interactive, interesting for the child, um, all those kinds of things. So some examples are up there. Um, I also saw in the chat, someone talked about virtual goggles. Um, and so virtual reality can be a way of using distraction. Um, just beware if your child is someone who likes to look, um, then the virtual reality goggles sometimes are not as useful because they cover kind of all of um, the visual field. But if that doesn't bother them, they don't feel like they need to look, virtual reality can be very immersive, very engaging, um, and very enjoyable and effective um, as a distractor. Some of the other things to cover uh, in terms of what to say, and these are principles that we talk about for um, parents and caregivers, but also to healthcare professionals, honestly, um, in terms of things that are more helpful to say uh, than otherwise. Um, we, uh, we suggest, and the research supports this, to use neutral words to signal that it's gonna start. So here we go, um, or focusing our language on the distraction or taking attention away from pain. Um, we all have, or many people have smartphones, which are great kind of distractors in our pocket as well, right? Because there's games and other videos. So those are good um, strategies and language to be using. We have uh, avoid uh, repeatedly reassuring the child, such as saying things like, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry. I'm sorry, this is happening to you. Um, it's interesting, reassurance is interesting because it's often our instinct to say that uh, when we see our child that's distressed. But what we've learned from some very cool research, including some that um, Megan's done, um, is that actually when we reassure, it's almost like it cues the child that there's actually something to be worried about. Um, and we can see that actually the more reassurance that happens, that can actually fuel some distress for the child over time. So better instead of reassuring to focus on distracting or paying it, or, you know, directing the child's attention to something different. We also avoid suggesting that it won't hurt at all um, and sticking with some of those neutral words. Sometimes you can say things like, let's find out what this feels like for you. Um, you know, this might be different for different people, but you can tell me what it's like for you afterwards. Um, and the idea behind that is that, you know, sometimes it might hurt a little bit um, uh, or it might hurt. And uh, we're not in the business of kind of lying or, you know, um, saying things to, ch to the child that then that might actually undermine how much they trust us um, as we think about other needle procedures and, and other things in the future. So best to stick with that neutral language and to use our words to kind of distract them or get them to pay attention to something away from the pain or away from the needle procedure itself. And what to do afterwards, you're not done. And often with all of your uh, children or youth living with rheumatological conditions, it's not just a one-off needle procedure, right? There's often repeated ones that can happen, um, uh, whether it's injections or blood draws or otherwise. And some really great research suggests that what we say after the fact can actually make a difference for how next time. So better focus on positive aspects of the experience. This doesn't mean unrealistic or kind of pie in the sky. What it means is focus on the things that your child did well. Um, maybe they sat still, maybe they kept their arms still, um, maybe that you saw them using their distraction strategies um, or you know some other strategies we'll talk about today. Um, and that can help them remember the experience in a more neutral or more positive way. And that actually predicts less pain and less distress um, at future procedures. 
Uh, you can focus on bravery and just catch any exaggerations, right? So the child says, oh, the needle, it was this big, you know, actually being able to draw that back to something that's, that's more realistic um, to, to, so that they remember it in kind of that uh, more realistic or more neutral or pause way. Um, and avoiding pain and fear related words. Those can become part of their memories, which can then kind of increase pain and distress uh, at future procedures as well. Okay, so next I'll be talking about dizziness and fainting, why it happens and what we can do about it. So some people, when they get a needle, they might feel really dizzy, lightheaded, sweaty, or maybe like they're going to throw up. And some people faint or, or pass out from needles. And so why does this happen? So fainting happens when someone's blood pressure and heart rate speed up really, really fast and then suddenly drop. And so fainting is actually, it's common, uh, more common in people with needle fear, but not everyone who is afraid of needles will faint. And not everyone who faints is afraid of needles. And fainting um, and dizziness needles tends to be more common in teenagers. The good news is that there's a tool that can help with feeling dizzy and faint from needles, which is called muscle tension. And basically how this works is that it keeps a person's blood pressure up so that drop doesn't happen. And so this is a tool that can be helpful in those who have a history of fainting or dizziness. And it's safe to use in kids who are um, seven years of age or older, teens and adults. And what it involves is alternating between tensing and releasing muscles. And so I'll go through those steps um, in just a minute. Um, and it's a tool that you can use before, during, and after the needle until those feelings um, of faint and dizziness pass. So how to practice muscle tension. Um, so it involves first just sitting comfortably and um, tensing your muscles in your legs and your stomach. And you can also squeeze the muscles in your arm that is not getting the needle. And so you'll squeeze for about 10 to 15 seconds or until your face feels warm or flushed. And then you release the tension for between 20 to 30 seconds. And so an important piece here is that you release the tension, but you don't wanna fully relax your muscles because remember, we wanna keep that blood pressure up. And so relaxing muscles can actually decrease heart rate and blood pressure. And so it's important to alternate between tensing and just releasing that tension. And so you'll repeat that until the procedure is over or until that um, feeling of faintness um, passes. Okay, so we've now covered the tools for low to medium levels of fear. And so we wanted to just take a minute and have um, you reflect on whether there are any questions um, about this section so far. And if so, to please enter them into the chat um, and we'll cover that during the Q&A period. And so next we will be talking now about what can help for that high level of needle fear. And when thinking about what helps with high fear, it can be helpful to think about the parts of fear, which we sort of started talking about earlier. So there are three parts to fear and all of them are connected. And I actually had you thinking about these parts earlier when I asked you to think about something that you're afraid of. So the first part or one of the parts are our thoughts or the words that we say to ourselves. So when we're scared, we think or worry that something bad is going to happen. Another part is those, are those body feelings. So when we feel scared, we can usually feel it in our body. And the last part is actions or what we do. So when we feel scared, we tend to want to run away, avoid the situation or the thing that um, we're afraid of. Um, maybe defend ourselves against it, or we freeze because we're so afraid. And so there are a few things that can help. And the first tool and most important tool that we'll talk about 
addresses the actions part of fear or that urge that we get when we're afraid. And so the tool that helps with this is to do the exact opposite of trying to escape or avoid the thing that we're afraid of and to face that fear. And so since this one is the most important tool, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, and Megan is going to explain next why facing fears um, is helpful. Okay, so <clears throat> research has really shown us that facing our fears gradually is the most important tool, as Caitlin um, suggested, in reducing high fears that are out of proportion to the danger posed, right? So this isn't for facing bears in the woods. Um, this is for fears that are out of proportion or like false alarms, as Caitlin mentioned before. So this approach, um, it can be called exposure-based treatment, um, falls under or is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy. So on the slide, you can see what we call our worry hill. Um, so it shows the amount of time spent in the situation on the x-axis and then the amount of fear on kind of the y-axis. So when someone is asked to face their fear situation, um, such as a needle, the fear typically increases right to the highest point that we see at the top there. They get right up to the top and then it does decrease over time. Okay. Um, so exposure and facing your fear works um, on the basis of a few principles. So the first is that it's designed um, to test whatever someone is most worried about is going to happen. So this is called like their catastrophic belief. Like what am I most worried about is going to happen? And so how is this addressed? This is addressed um, by having an individual in the feared situation long enough and learning with practice that their fear does in fact come down over time because it can be hard <laughs> to notice that um, when we're super afraid. Um, so that they, they are supposed to notice that their fear is going to come down over time, that whatever they're worried about isn't going to happen. They're gaining evidence for that or that if it does happen, they can survive it, okay? Again, this is for fears that are out of proportion to the danger posed. So it's really important that whatever the person is afraid of is actually captured in our practices of facing our fear. So for example, um, if I'm really worried about seeing blood when I get a needle and I do all these like practices, but in none of the practices do I ever see blood, then I actually haven't faced my fear, right? You gotta actually face the thing um, that you really don't wanna face. Okay, so next slide. So I sort of hinted at this before. Um, people often think, no, no, my fear just stays up, right? Just stays up all the time. So fear really does, will come down. Um, but the problem is the natural tendency is to get the heck out of there. Like you want to escape, right? But if you escape, if you sort of go teleport, I call it teleporting off or jumping off the hill, um, then you've actually um, made it more challenging over time because you're thinking to yourself, my fear is not going to come down if I escape then. Oh, it's, that was horrible. And it didn't come down at all. And I can't manage that. Right. So that's why it's really important to stay in the situation long enough because fear does come down over time. So basically, if if we allow the escaping, then it maintains or can even increase the fear. OK, so the, an important thing here as we move to our next slide is that we're actually practicing um, very our steps very gradually. Right. So we're not saying, oh, you're forced to stay in a needle situation, meaning you're forced to have a needle, say, stuck in your arm until your fear comes down. OK, so we're going to break it down further. Don't worry. OK, so um, we need to practice staying in that situation long enough so that we gain confidence um, that we can handle it, that our fear is going to come down. And the thing that we're most worried about is going to happen is not going to happen. OK, so our next slide shows ideally what happens over time. So the person gains firsthand experience through their exposures, through facing their fear that they can get through these situations, right? And so what happens is um, if we take a situation, say, um, like looking at a needle in, in a book, 
Um, the first time they face it, the fear is really, it goes up very high, the big steep worry hill, right? Maybe the next time they, they face it, we see the yellow line. Then the third time, maybe the red line, the fourth time, the black line, right? That's what you tend to see with practice, with um, gradually facing your fear. So we're going to break this down a lot more, and I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin for the next part. So we know we've talked about, you know, the main tool to help reduce fears, to face fear, to be in those um, needle related situations that are scary. And so we're going to be doing this in small steps. So like climbing a ladder. And so when we think about facing fear, we need to come up with situations that can be used for practice. And so there are three steps for this part. And so the first step is to list different situations related to needles that scare your child. And step two is to have your child pick a number to show how scary each of the situations are for them. And the last step is to put those situations in order from least to most scary. And so we'll go through each of these steps in more detail. So step one is to make a list of situations related to the needles. And so these are situations that your child will do to practice facing their fear. And for this step, you can really get creative about different situations with needles that would be scary for them. So just you can start by brainstorming all the ideas that come up. Um, and on the slide here, we have some examples of what that might look like. So for example, um, looking at a picture of a needle, maybe holding a real needle with a cap on or holding it with a cap off, waiting in the waiting room where they'll get the needle, driving to the location where they'll get the needle, um, smelling the alcohol swab, having their arm cleaned, imagining getting a needle, so picturing the sights, the sounds, and the smells. Also watching a video of someone getting a needle or watching that in real life. And then at the top would be getting a needle. And so it's helpful to keep in mind that it can be really scary to just think about these situations. Um, so talking about them or reading them on a page and so this first step is already good practice for your child in facing their fear by having them talk about and come up with these situations. So the next step is really about organizing that list. So for each situation you come up with, um, your child will pick a number between zero to 10 for how scary the situation is for them. So we'll be talking about zero to 10 here for simplicity, but there are some adaptations for how your child could rate the situation, like pointing at faces. And we can speak more to that during the Q&A period, if that's something that you'd like to know more about. Um, but for the rest of kind of our presentation, we'll be using zero to 10. So for each situation, you can ask this question. So how scary from zero to 10 would it be to see a picture of a needle or to hold a real needle with a cap on. And again, important to keep in mind that since fear is individual, what number one person gives for one situation could be very different from a number that someone else might give. And so no one else can tell your child what their number should be. And the practice will really only be helpful if the list is true for them. So as Megan mentioned, if it includes situations that they're actually scared of, and um, also their level of fear is going to be unique to them. And so it's also helpful to keep in mind that the situations should range from zero to 10. So some situations should only be a little bit scary, some should be a medium amount, and some should be quite scary. Okay, and step three is to put those situations in order. And so to do that, we have a picture of a ladder um, on it. And we use a ladder because it has small steps to help you get to the top. And that's really how this practice works, is taking small steps to face the fears of needles. And each step on the ladder is a situation related to needles that you can practice to work your way up to getting a needle. And so to organize the ladder, it can be helpful to put the situations in order 
from least scary at the bottom to most scary at the top. And so for most people at the top should be to get a needle. And so we have an example here of what that might look like for someone. So looking at a picture of a needle might be just a little scary for someone, but holding an, a real needle is about medium or high, high amount of scary. And so um, it can be helpful to have about eight to 10 situations on the ladder, ranging from a little bit to very scary. And here's an example what this might look like. Um, and so there are about eight to 10 situations. They range, um, they have a range of fear ratings. So from two to 10. And, um, and so once you come up with a ranked list of these fear situations, then you're ready to actually practice facing the fear. And so Megan will next walk us through what that practice looks like. Okay, so thanks, Caitlin. Once you make your ladder, it's really time to practice, right? Um, facing fear. So there's parts to this as well. So first, um, the first part is to choose a situation, which is easy now that you've done the hard work of creating the ladder because you're going to start at the bottom. When we climb a ladder, we don't throw ourselves at the middle or try to grab onto the top rung. So we are going to start at the bottom, right? Um, so one of the things that's um, a bit tricky is that when we're thinking about all of the needle situations all together, something like looking at a needle in a book might be like, oh yeah, that's only two out of 10. But suddenly right before I actually have to do it, it might get a lot scarier for me. So we actually need to have the young person rate how scary it is to do with it, like right in that moment, how scary is it for them to think, they're going to have to look at a picture of a needle in a book. So I understand before there are different ratings that were used to order the ladder. Those kind of, after you've ordered them, they kind of get put aside. And then it's really about, okay, for you at this moment, what is it like if I asked you, if I said, you know, in the next minute, you're going to look at a picture of a needle in a book. How scary would that be for you from zero to 10, right? So they rate um, how scary it would be before starting the practice. And then they actually face their fear. So in my example, um, then they're looking um, at a picture of a needle in a book. They are, again, staying in the situation until the fear goes down um, or it really doesn't feel scary to do at all. Um, and so for younger kids, you know, parents can help by checking in um, about how scared they're feeling during the practice to know when the practice should be over. And you can pay attention to, of course, to body language, right? Um, and remembering that when we're really afraid, you know, that fight, flight, freeze kind of response can come out, right? So parents can ask about every 30 seconds, you know, how scary does it feel now, right? From zero to 10. So we want them to stay in until it comes down. Um, and when we go to the next slide, um, we can see an, an example here. So the um, it's ordered again, um, say from, from low to high. Um, if this were a fear ladder, again, we're starting at the bottom, we would be looking at a picture of a needle in a book until the fear rating goes down to zero. Um, probably for the next step, looking at a picture, say, of, of someone else getting a vaccination, we'd want that one to go down to zero. Once we start getting into the middle and higher, we probably want the fear ratings just to go down by half. Um, and it's really important to know, too, that people are not going to suddenly love needles, right, at the end of the day. It's not going to be like, oh, great, now I have no fear and, like, I am just loving going to get a needle. There's probably going to be some worry about needles still um, but what we want to see is a is a reduction and also an ability to cope um, through the needles it's unrealistic for us to think yay like I want to go have like have a needle none of us probably feel that way um, so it's not fair to to have the young people expected to to do so so um yes for the lower situations you want to go down to zero for the sort of um, upper ones middle and upper ones you want to go to half so um if it was rated as an eight before the practice, you want to go to a four. Now, remember that you may have to practice these situations multiple times. So no one said you're going to go step one, looking at a picture, and then immediately to looking at a picture of vaccination, step two, within the same practice, right? You may have to practice the same step repeatedly, okay, until it's not um, fear-inducing anymore. Okay, next slide, please. 
So this is tough, right? Like, listen to what we have just been talking about, we're, what we're asking these young people do. And frankly, this is also tough for parents. And this involves a lot of work and energy, right? And I, I can see Katie nodding, right? She knows. Um, and for any of us who've actually done this with our, you know, with our clients, um, maybe with our own children, um, this is this is tough work. So we focused here on rewarding your young person, um, but I would happily extend that also to rewarding yourself um, for for hard work. So for all of us, when we're trying to do something that's difficult for us, we may need a little bit of an extra push and rewards can help here. OK, so next slide. Um, we all like being given praise, right? It makes us feel good um, and more likely to do the thing that we were just praised for again. So with rewards, we're always pairing the rewards with praise, okay? So we don't give up on the praise, we keep that. Um, so uh, rewards motivate us, motivate us to do hard things. Um, and they can be really small items um, from the dollar store, for example. They don't have to be expensive. They don't have to cost money at all. It could be time spent doing a preferred activity with you. In fact, that can be some of the most rewarding um, types of, uh, or the best types of rewards to choose, actually. So it could be, you know, time to go to the library, playing a card game, playing a family, um, you know, having a family board game night choosing the movie for a movie night at home, all sorts of things, choosing the dinner. So it's important though that, the, that your young person is interested in the reward, right? So we can come up with our own rewards that we think would be good, but ultimately the young person has to be um, interested so that they're motivated to work hard, right? We want to go after small, frequently earned rewards. Please do not promise a trip to Disney World, right? It's too big, it's not feasible for people to be doing. And what ends up happening when people do big rewards is they say, it's usually something like, you have to do everything perfectly many, 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 many times, and then you get this big, huge thing. Well, what happens if there's a hiccup? Everything's lost, so I have no motivation to work on that anymore. So you wanna do small, frequently earned rewards. So the devil is in the details, honestly, with reward programs. Um, so, you know, the first thing to do is identify what we call the target behavior. So how do you know, like, what's, what's actually going to be rewarded? Um, how do you know that completing the practice has been done, right? So you have to really kind of outline that. Um, and we want to give the reward immediately after earning it. For older kids, they can be given points that they can then cash in for rewards um, later. And we'll, we'll talk about that next slide. Rewards need to consistently follow the behavior, right? We learn best when that happens. And again, I said it needs to be um, always combined um, with praise. So if you're not doing um, a reward after each one, next slide, you're, you're gonna do a reward after each one, excuse me. But if you're not doing like kind of the small items after each, um, In, um, for rewards. Okay, so you probably may have used these things for other behaviors um, with your young person, and reward programs really are not meant to stay the same over huge lengths of time. They're meant to change and shift depending on kind of what you, what your young person is sort of ch being challenged with. Okay, um, so rewards are going to vary by the individual um, and really remember that time with you or time doing things as a family and, and those sorts of things can often actually be very rewarding. It does not have to cost a lot of money. Okay, next slide. So having worked with um, a, a number of youth with, with needle fear and families um, to face their fears, there's a lot of common questions that come up from doing these practices. Um, so we've listed some of them here. So the first question is, what if there are too many situations on um, the list, right? So we have some um, families who are really um, conscientious and they list all the situations and there's just a lot. There's like, there's 30 things, 40 things um, that they could do, okay? So perhaps, I mean, you definitely need to narrow it down. You definitely need to make it so that it's not a ladder to the moon, 
right? So maybe you're only working on a particular type of needle procedure right now. So um, maybe it's, it's around joint injections, for example. Um, you can also, if there's multiple situations that are given the same number that are sort of around the same level of fear, you don't have to do all of them necessarily, right? You can sort of maybe eliminate some of those other ones. Um, the flip um, issue often comes up too. What if there are not enough situations on the list? Okay, so um, we can actually break the, down the situations into smaller parts. Um, you can do that by um, being very creative in terms of thinking about like, what is everything that kind of leads up to the actual needle, right? Um, and then what are some things that need to be buried maybe within that? So location, is it at home versus at the clinic? Is it the people present? Is it who's actually doing the injection, for example? Um, and then just even in terms of like the needle itself, is it how close it is, you know, um, to your young person? So we've done this actually within my lab and we've come up with like, uh, like two pages or three pages or four pages of situations, the way that we can kind of break it down. So um, if, you, if you're ever struggling, reach out or maybe we're gonna give this as part of resources um, because we certainly have brainstormed a number of these. Uh, next question is how often to practice. So the more practice, the better. Um, and so you need to aim for at least one practice a day. There is evidence in the research literature that um, you can actually do longer periods within a single session of exposure of facing fears. Um, and actually make significant progress, but that's hard work. Um, and I think, you know, the young person really has to be motivated to do that because otherwise that could just be really um, very difficult, but we want to make steady progress, right? And so if you practice one day and then don't practice again for a few days, you might feel like you're just starting from scratch or starting from the beginning each time. So try for at least one practice a day. Next slide. So if parents are present um, when um, your child is practicing facing their fear, they should be providing encouragement towards brave behavior. So I know you can do this, you're so brave, um, to foster um, confidence in your child. Um, and you know, it's important to avoid reassuring statements here too that can actually inadvertently communicate to your child that they have something to worry about or that they're only safe because you're there or it's only safe because you said it's okay, right? So this can happen and, and it, it is a bit challenging, um, but try to you know, provide the encouragement. And if it looks like you know, over time, your child's really depending on you have to do certain things in very particular ways, then that might actually be something that you then start to manipulate as a part of um, another set of exposures. The practice should last as long uh, as possible until the fear comes down, right? Because remembering that escape issue. Okay. If it's going on for really way too long, then as long as the fear has come down by at least sort of one point, okay, you can stop and then, and then try again another time. Remember, we're celebrating um, after and rewarding after the practice, um, and we're repeating the practice as needed on that step until the fear is um, to zero for the lower fear situations or by half. Um, and it may help to actually visually track progress um, for, for the young person. They may actually want to have posters up about what they've done and like how well they've done on things, right? It may actually help them. Um, we often get asked, when will my child be ready um, for a needle? It's really important to work through all the steps before getting, um, before actually getting the needle to give yourself the best sort of chance of success. Um, so we don't do all when we try to jump to the top of a ladder, same thing if we're trying to skip a bunch of steps, it, it really, it tends to put you in a, a difficult sort of situation. So they need to complete all of the steps. Sometimes practice feels too hard, um, even at the bottom step. So if it just feels like you can't even get started, put on your sort of creative thinking hat again and modify the step, not avoid it. Okay, um, so try to make it in some way less scary, but still complete a step. And then, you know, then you have another one kind of in your back pocket for the next um, kind of exposure that you need to do. Another option may be to use a coping strategy before um, starting the practice so that they're, you know, relatively calm before the practice. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And so I'll turn it back over to Caitlin. 
All right. So to kind of recap a bit of what we've just been talking about, really um, practice facing fear, being in those um, situations uh, related to needles that are scary is really going to be the best tool um, to, to reduce that fear. But we know that sometimes it can be really hard to get started with the first step. And sometimes it can be really challenging to um, even start with the situation that was at the bottom of the ladder. Um, as Megan said, sometimes what can happen is when we go to start the practice and face the fear that maybe the fear gets really, really high and higher um, than, than we expected. And so it can make it really tough to maybe just get started with the practice. And so if that is something that happens and it's really hard to start the facing fears, then some tools like relaxation or using coping statements before practice can be really helpful. And it's important that they're used before facing fears and not during. And this is because it can distract your child during their practice when they should be feeling a bit afraid in, in gradual steps so that their body learns that they do not need to feel afraid or feel very afraid of these situations. And so if they're focused on something else during their practice, maybe like relaxing their muscles, um, then they might not actually be feeling that fear. And so the practice isn't really having the effect that um, we want it to have. And so I mentioned that um, earlier that another part of fear is those body feelings that can come up when we're afraid. And so a tool that can help for that is relaxation. So here's a summary of some of the body sensations that can come up when we're feeling afraid. And so um, some people might experience an upset stomach and some people they might feel sweaty in their hands or palms or they feel their their breathing is faster and maybe their muscles tense up they feel their heart breathing really or heart beating really fast so when these ha things happen there's a few things that um, a few tools that can help with this so we'll be talking specifically about three relaxation tools and I'll go over each in some details, but we'll also provide the links to some websites that have guided relaxation or scripts that you can follow. And you might already be aware of some of these. So the first is deep breathing. So what this involves is slowing down your breathing by inhaling slowly through your nose and out through your mouth. So Children can try um, to start inhaling um, for four seconds, exhaling for six seconds, or whatever count works for your child. So some people really like to have that count to follow. So breathe in for one, two, three, four. Others like to just work at their own pace. So the goal is really to just slow down the breathing. And some tips for this tool is that the belly should move and not the chest. And so for some kids, this can be tricky to do. And so some kids might find it helpful to practice first by lying down and putting maybe an object or a stuffy or something on their stomach so that they can see it move up and down when they breathe in and out to know that they're breathing from their belly. Some kids um, sometimes report um, getting dizzy. If that's the case, then they need to slow down their breathing. So some kids might get excited and breathe in and out really quickly. And so sometimes they might need some coaching to um, slow down that breathing. The next tool is progressive muscle relaxation. And so when we're feeling afraid, afraid, our muscles can become really tense and that uses a lot of body energy. And so another way to relax the body is to practice tensing or squeezing muscles for five seconds and then relaxing the muscles and repeating this with different muscle groups, practicing tensing one muscle at a time. 
And so for younger kids, including imagery and concrete examples can be really helpful. So that's where our lemons on the screen here come in. So for example, you might imagine squeezing a lemon for lemonade. And so you squeeze really hard, squeeze those muscles for five seconds and then relax and release the tension. Or you might imagine a turtle going into their shell to work the shoulders or to tense those shoulder muscles. And so I point out here too that this is different from muscle tension. So with muscle tension, you don't want to relax your body. You want to keep that blood pressure up. With muscle relaxation, the goal is to release and relax those muscles. And so we have also more um, details in, in our handouts and the slides later on um, about these differences and where to get more information. All right, and the last um, relaxation tool is a mental vacation or guided imagery. So this can be a really fun way to relax by using your imagination to create pictures in your mind of a place that is peaceful or calming. So it could be a place real or imaginary or a picture of something um, that you'd like. And so some examples could be um, in a forest, at a beach, river, lake, mountains. Um, it can be, can, you can get really creative with this. And so there are some guided imagery audios and scripts that can be followed, but um, you can also have your child choose a place and really encourage them to be detailed because the more detailed they can be, the better. So having them really engage their senses and what they might experience, like what they might see, what they might hear, smell, or taste in that um, happier, peaceful place. So here's um, a summary of some resources that you can consult with. Um, to get some guidance um, with relaxation um, through scripts, audio files, videos. And so the list here, they, they present similar information, but in different ways. Um, so you have a web resource as well as some apps. Okay, and then the last tool that we will talk about um, for high fear is, um, is challenging and changing thoughts. And so this tool can be really helpful for kids who have a lot of worries or unhelpful thoughts about the needles. So the way we think about a situation is quite powerful in shaping how we feel and in turn, what we end up doing in this situation. So our thoughts can be helpful when they're realistic, balanced and include both the difficult and the pleasant or encouraging parts. So for example, I'm feeling scared for this needle, but I can take a deep breath and I can take a deep breath. So thoughts can also be unhelpful. So like when our thoughts are maybe not true or when they make us feel stuck in feeling scared. And so it can be helpful to determine whether a thought is helpful or unhelpful by asking um, the questions on the screen here. So what is the proof that the thought will come true? How many times has it happened before? Am I 100% sure that it will happen? What is the worst case scenario? Best case, most likely. And so if there's little proof that the thought will come true, it has never happened before, and it's not 100% certain, the thought is probably unhelpful and it makes sense to change the thought. And so we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, but sometimes our thoughts are not completely wrong, but they're still unhelpful or they keep us feeling scared. And so if that's the case, it can be helpful to problem solve. So if that worry did happen, what can I do? So sometimes it involves getting answers, like what's the reason? for the needle or, you know, how does medicine work in the vaccination that I'm going to get? Another option is to kind of surf the worry, wait for it to come down and create a plan that we'll talk about in a minute as well. So one way to change unhelpful thoughts is to create a coping statement, which are words of encouragement that your child can say to themselves to make a situation um, less scary. So they're balanced and realistic. So for example, I've done this before, I can do this again, this is a bit scary, and I can do hard things. 
So if your child is having a hard time coming up with statements, it can be helpful to have them think about, you know, what their favorite superhero or character might do in this situation or what they would tell someone else like a sibling or a parent. And so for more um, details and information on the thoughts piece, Anxiety Canada, that web page from the previous slide um, has a lot of helpful resources on this as well. Okay, so that covers the tools for high level of fear. So again, just want to take a minute and if there are any questions that came up from this section, we encourage you to pop it in the chat. Um, but uh, Megan will next walk us through making a plan. So um, yes, I'm going to actually, we're going to email out the slides for, for making a plan. So I'm going to go over these pretty quickly because it's more important for you to have templates or see the templates so that you can use them for yourselves. But so basically we've learned a lot about um, fear, pain, dizziness and fainting and lots of tools and strategies to help. Um, so you might be thinking, what do I do with all this information? Um, and so our answer is make a plan and think about what would be helpful um, for you to do and for young, your young person to do um, or what you need to know um, before getting a needle. So the next slide shows some examples of what tools we can use to make needles less scary and what tools we can use to make um, needles hurt less. And so the plan can be, um, you know, made with your child or if they're older, they can do it themselves um, where they're sort of choosing among these things that what they think will work for them. And remember that if high fear is present, practicing facing your fear kind of has to be on um, on that plan. And then the next slide um, is an important part of um, a plan, which um, young people need to let their parents know how they can support them, right? So this plan shows how um, the parents of this young person can help them. And so, you know, we know that our young people will let us know um, what is helpful and what's not so helpful um, when we're trying to help them. And so it's really important um, to kind of come up with a plan together about what works for them. So we will email out um, some templates uh, for that. And I will turn it over to Katie. Sure, thanks, uh, Megan and Caitlin. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes just to talk about particular considerations that can come up for particular types of medications that some of uh, youth with rheumatological conditions might be taking. Um, and actually, there was one question about this uh, in the chat, um, suggesting no issues with other types of needle procedures, but really struggling with um, methotrexate, which uh, can create a lot of anxiety and this um, issue that's known uh, for some people, not all people that use methotrexate, um, uh, but for some use, uh, it can lead to anticipatory nausea. So, and sometimes even vomiting ahead of time um, that becomes kind of this, this paired association that happens uh, in the context of this particular medication. And this is what we call a conditioned or a learned response. Um, you know, the needle happens to give the medication, the medication for some people has a side effect of this nausea. And then actually, if you move to the next slide, Caitlin, um, then we can start to kind of anticipate this nausea feeling, even when we think about the methotrexate injections. And that condition or learned response can be some so powerful in our brain that actually we might even feel nauseous not just when the needle is happening, but sometimes the color yellow, the color of the medication might cause like trigger us to feel nauseous. Just talking about it, thinking about what day of the week we have our methotrexate injections, you know, where it is in the house, you know, some of those thoughts can actually lead youth to feel um, anxious or sometimes even vomit. And I think the example in the chat was even that smell of alcohol, because that's part of that step to proceed. It's kind of starting to generalize and all of these things associated with this medication can start to lead on their own, even if we don't take the medication, can lead us to kind of feel, it can lead us to feel nauseous. So what do we do about it? So that's, that's what's happening. Um, you can go to the next slide, Caitlin. So basically what we need to do is we need to switch up that routine. We need to break that conditioned or learned response um, so that the brain can learn actually these things can happen in the absence of feeling nauseous or in the absence of vomiting. So sometimes things you can do are changing up where you're doing it in the house, 
doing a different order of the preparatory steps that come into play. So if normally you do this, then this, then this, you know, in terms of the alcohol swab, preparation of the needle, um, you know, all of those steps, and it happens in the same place in the house, start to switch some of those things up. Use the strategies like distraction, use the strategies like relaxation. And in some instances, there are actually anti-nausea medications uh, that you can take to help. So talk to your rheumatologist or your child's rheumatologist about that. But you're, what you're trying to do is basically break this association that this equals vomiting. Um, so you need to just do things to shake up the routine as much as possible. All right. So to end our workshop, we'd like to point out some resources that talk more about the topics that we went over today. Um, so if you'd like more information on managing needle-related fear, pain, and fainting, the first link um, will guide you to a really lovely PDF kind of master list that summarizes some existing resources on evidence-based tools for helping with needles. And um, it's organized for various audiences, so young people, parents, adults, um, as well as healthcare providers. And the link below includes a more recent resource that was released after the master list was created, um, but is quite helpful as it goes over a lot of the concepts that we covered today and helping um, those who are afraid of needles. And we also know that some individuals might need more help to work through these steps and facing fears um, and might need support from a mental health professional. As Megan mentioned, this is a lot of work. Um, and it's, it takes a lot of work to face your fears. And so um, we know that some people might need more help and it can also be overwhelming process to figure out kind of where to go and how to get started. And so the final um, website listed here contains some recommended referrals for kind of evidence-based supports and services for anxiety and fears um, that was created by a psychologist, Dr. Martin Antony, who's a leading kind of expert on anxiety. And um, so it, it has a list for um, mostly targeted for North America um, supports. And so it's organized by kind of country, province, state. And there are certainly more options to get additional supports than those listed in that um, site, but it can also be a starting point to get started. And so these are some of the key resources, um, but there are a couple others that we'll, I'll quickly highlight next um, because there are just so many excellent resources that are out there. Um, and so here are a few more, and I'll just point out the card um, system that um, the strategies that we talked about today, especially around pain, are really consistent with this system, which is the comfort, ask, relax, and distract system. Um, that um, goes over that information. And so at the website um, here, you can access handouts and videos. And there's also a video game that was recently released for kids to play and learn about um, the card system. The other resources listed here can also be helpful and they really provide similar information, but in different ways to really try to reach as many um, people as possible. So with that, um, we'd like to thank you so much for your attention today and listening to us go through and talk about um, needle-related fear, pain, and fainting. Um, and if you're interested in future kind of workshop opportunities and training specifically on needle fear, um, please reach out to Dr. McMurtry. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank Megan, Katie, and Caitlin so much for an amazing presentation. And what I love is it just wasn't a high level overview, but I think everyone took things they can like say or do if it's shot night tonight or Friday night, as many people in our community uh, have a very uh, active Friday nights on the shot front. So um, I really think that you've armed them with you know, like real words they can use to their children or strategies that they can start right away. Um, and I'm really excited to get into some of the questions that have come through while you were presenting. Um, so I think for the first one, um, there was a question from Krista and um, I think Megan, maybe you could answer this one, um, but it's just about like how 
how young is a fear of needle encounter? Like where, do, where does this start? And she gave an example of like a baby with the first poke. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the researcher in me says we don't have the best research around this um, because often what we're what we're doing is we're um, we're either following uh, kids having negative experiences, and we absolutely do know from negative experiences come needle fears for sure. And we also have um, some studies that are with adults saying like, when did you first develop your fear of needles? And then they have to try to remember when that happened. So we actually need better research on exactly when this can kind of happen. We do know that babies have physiological memories um, that can create um, situations where previous negative experiences then lead to future negative experiences for them. So let me give you an example. Anna Taddeo showed that when baby boys were circumcised without analgesic, without any pain medications, um, they showed more behavioral distress six months later at their vaccinations. Okay, so those babies can't tell us that they're afraid, but their body is reacting in a way that is different than, than um, babies that were able to receive pain medications. So it's really important right from the get-go um, that we try to have um, pain management in place. Needle fears tend, we, the best estimate right now is that severe needle fears tend to develop somewhere between five and seven years of age. Um, I suspect that younger kids also may have them, but it's it's just a different ball game and trying to understand exactly what's kind of going on um, with them and their ability to really describe is more limited. I know for myself, um, when we were doing our national um, pain and, and fear guidelines that Katie was also involved in, I had um, my son at the time was a was a nursing infant. No, maybe he was a bit older at that time. He at one point he started waving bye bye at like I think about eighteen months. He started waving bye bye to our pediatrician as soon as he walked in or as soon as I carried him in um, to the office. He was like bye 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 because he did not want to be anywhere near her because of the because of the needle and I thought oh boy like I, I'm really trying with the pain management strategies he always had them and yet still he was showing some kind of needle fear to me um, and so I was trying to address it so that was a very long-winded way of saying um, physiological memories for sure um, can form very early on we think that our best um Evidence is that it's around five to seven severe needle fears can develop. Um, and we actually, related to this, we don't necessarily know, like there's no one thing that's gonna cause someone to develop a needle fear versus someone not to, right? So for some people, they may have a negative experience and they don't develop needle fear, right? So I, I am like that. I had a hor like horrible experiences getting my blood drawn when I was, um, having an appendectomy as a child, but somehow I never developed a needle fear, right? Whereas other people may actually not have had a really negative experience, but still fear a needle. Um, so it's really a constellation of things that can kind of create the situation. Right. And I think oh, that's one of the things I loved about the strategies when you guys were explaining them, because we have such a range of ages, like obviously there's toddlers diagnosed with rheumatic conditions, and then there's 13, 14 year olds diagnosed. And so the strategy seemed to me easily like applicable at a young age and even for a teenager, and they could take more control in it. Um, another question that we had, um, and I think maybe Katie, um, just given that you worked with the rheumatology team closely at Alberta Children's Hospital, um, there were a couple of people who asked about sedation. So the recommendation of sedating either a very resistant child or maybe a young child. And what is your experience and recommendations around that? Yeah, this question often comes up when needle fears are really high or um, because, you know, I think as someone mentioned in this chat, my kid is trying to get out of the house, right? Even when we're talking about this. So for some youth, they can end up with very, very, very high levels of needle fears. And sometimes from a medical intervention perspective, we can't wait, right? Um, you know, and there's a, there's an urgency or a really high need 
um, to do some sort of medical intervention, a treatment um, that involves a needle procedure. And in instances like that, uh, sedation is uh, considered and sometimes used uh, very appropriately. Um, what I will say is um, it's generally not your best long-term solution, right? So, um, you know, it can be really good if something is needed urgently, but it's a good cue that actually your child has high levels of needle fear. And so do what needs to be done in the short term with that initial procedure, but then really get on this plan and seek out some of that additional support um, to use the strategies that are talked about here today. Get a referral. If you're followed at a hospital, get a referral to the medical psychologist um, or medical psychology at your hospital um, for some key support. Uh, so certainly in my um, previous role at Alberta Children's and the psychologist is there now um, and at other hospitals across the country uh, are very well versed in managing needle fears. And so at that high level, it can be really nice to um, have some professional help on board uh, to support your family uh, to manage that. So, you know, if that's what needs to happen in the short term, that's what you do, right? Your child's health is, you know, the most important thing and that's okay. And and um, you know, ask about it, but just make that plan for longer term because uh, you don't want to end up in a position um, where your child needs to be sedated, you know, for a blood draw, right? And when that's something that might be an ongoing requirement to to manage their disease or or monitor monitor their medications, or if you end up in a situation where you need to take a medication or your child needs to take a medication that requires a needle procedure, and sedation is just not possible, right? On that continuous kind of basis. Um, the other thing I'll add about sedation and the benefit of, yes, it takes time, but the benefit of um, taking this gradual kind of exposure and, and um, gaining these skills is youth generally don't remember. They don't remember the sedation experiences, right? So they also don't get the opportunity to learn over time. I can do this. And this isn't as scary as I think it is, because if every time we rely on sedation, it can over time deliver the message that you can't handle this. This is a really, really scary thing. Um, so we want them to, you know, gradually start to have some of those successes um, over time. So hopefully that answers that question. It can be appropriate, but it's not your best kind of long term solution. Yeah, I think a lot of parents in our community really struggle with the wanting to, you know, go through the whole gradual process to bring their child down the path and empowering them and the pressure of, I have to give this shot every Friday, they need this medication or yeah. their, their, you know, joints are going to be affected, they're going to feel more pain, etc. And so that's, you know, exactly. a, a real tricky line to walk to try and do the strategies. But I think what I heard from you guys is that you know being consistent keeping up with the practice making incremental progress week after week is part of part of yeah I'll just add to Jennifer I've seen some families take like an interim approach to for a period of time which they've been able to arrange with their pharmacy or otherwise that they can go in there and have the weekly injection done so sometimes that's an kind of interim step they might be working towards you know, being able to do it at home, but not be able to do it in the hospital, but, you know, can kind of get that, that interim support. And um, one of the good things that has happened or potentially good things that's happened with um, vaccinations is a lot of more pharmacists are trained on providing injections uh, as well, you know, thinking about the COVID-19 vaccines, right? So, you know, that, that may increase kind of a pharmacist comfort uh, in being open to supporting um, some injections in, um, you know, in the pharmacy, which is maybe a little bit more convenient and possible as an interim step. I think that's actually a good lead way into another question. And Caitlin, um, with your sort of research and work around helping families manage needle fears, um, I think a lot of parents have a question of like, what, what's my role in it? Is there something that I'm doing or I'm letting off that's making my child more scared or is there something I can do to, to help them through? Um, and this relates to a question about um, what, what if a child has developed a strong preference for only one parent, usually mom, to give the injection? Um, and I like the line, it's becoming a problem for us because it really, it does become a problem. So I wondered what um, sort of strategies you could offer and just even stories or, anything about what you've experienced with families? Yeah, so those are great questions. And I, I'll first say that I think everyone is doing their best with you know, supporting um, 
your, you know, children with, with these experiences, with the information that they know, with the skills that they have. And we've talked about, you know, some things that are helpful to avoid during the procedure and during kind of brave practicing. And that though there's a real urge and it's common to want to say certain things because like reassurance, because we want to provide comfort. We don't like to see kids in pain and kids feeling afraid. So it's natural that um, some of these tools that we're talking about feel like counter counterintuitive to say, don't reassure repeatedly, you know, avoid saying things like it'll be okay, because often those are things that can be really kind of automatic when, um, when supporting um, a child. And for some kids, it might, you know, it, it might not have the same impact um, as someone who is really, really afraid in that situation. Um, and so I think that um, that's part of it, is just recognizing that we know everyone's doing the best they can and that some of these strategies probably feel counterintuitive. Um, and so part of what I see with goals for parents is to kind of be like, the cheerleader or like coach for their child with these practices and with these tools and um, kind of reminding them kind of what tools that they have to cope with needles um, and encouraging them and praising them for using for using them as well. And also, as Megan said, to kind of reward yourself for for doing that practice and um, alongside them, because it, it can also be a lot of work for parents. And um, and so recognizing that hard work as well. So I think that maybe answers the first part of the question. I'm not sure, Megan or Katie, if you have anything to add on that piece. I don't, I don't remember what the first versus the second part was, but I, I do, if we talk about, are you going to speak directly about for that parent who's, who's the one who's in charge of doing all of the injections? Are you going to speak to that piece? Right. Okay. Yes. I was going to ask what the second part was. Um, so I guess I would be curious to know um, the reasons that maybe one parent might be preferred over the other, because I think that that could maybe be incorporated too into the practice is that um, maybe practicing a small step with having another parent maybe prepare the medication or be present to just talk about the needles and in small steps to, um, to, to do things differently, because I wonder, because um, yeah, I, I would want to know a bit more about, okay, so what is it about being with one parent? Does it make you feel more safe? And does it maybe serve as one of those safety behaviors that we talked about that this only feels safe right now because I have, you know, mom or dad with me? Um, and, and so I would also want to know more about that as well. Megan or Katie, did you, I know this is a, probably a big one. Did either of you have any experience or, or anything to add on that one? Yeah, I can add a little bit. Um, sometimes there's opportunity to give child choice. Um, so, you know, if there's four injections that need to have, you know, if it's a weekly injection, let's say, um, preferred parent can be chosen three times and other parent can be chosen one time. So child gets to choose, but out of the month, that's how it goes. So if child chooses one parent the first three weeks, okay, then it's the other parent um, you know, the last week, or maybe they'll choose it a different day, right? So there's a way to kind of set limits around the choice mm -hmm. that you offer um, to youth. So it's still empowering to them, but it's within certain parameters that actually push them towards um, being able to try something different. And then I'll just say, if you're not the prefer preferred parent, don't take it personally and stick with it, you know, like... <laughs> You know, I think this is a good opportunity, like to collaborate as partners, you know, as parent as as parents for your children and, you know, creating space to, you know, persist and support each other, you know, because uh, no doubt the injections can be hard and those, in, you know, um, nights can be challenging for kids. They're also challenging for parents too, right? So, um, you know, just kind of working together to navigate some of that, dis the, that decision making. But I think Caitlin had some great suggestions to build towards that gradually as well. Yeah, I think I've definitely heard some like beautiful family dances around injection night where like one person holds the iPad and the other applies the ice and like often the siblings are involved in a part yeah. of it. Um, so I think, you know, families can really create 
their own story around it, involving the child and making choices while still achieving their ultimate goal, which is to get the medication in. Yeah, um, and I'll just say that to add to, add to that, Jennifer, because you're right, like it can become a dance right for the evening and sometimes that dance can become a delayed dance that actually extends over the whole <laughs> evening so I'll just reiterate kind of my point about you know you can create choice but you can set limits around mm -hmm. choice for children too and have kind of natural consequences or have rewards built in um, to be able to do things within that parameter so sometimes we can give too much choice um, especially when fear is present for the child to say, I need to be ready. I need to have all of these things, right? And that can lead to a lot of delay. So, you know, it's okay as a parent to set some limits around, you know, are you going to do it this way or this way? We're doing it regardless, mm -hmm. you know, but here's some very appropriate choice um, that gives them a little bit of autonomy, but still sets the stage. Um, you know, you're, you continue to be the parent, right? And so that's okay, even though it's something that can be distressing and it's something you prefer your child not have to go through, um, but you still you know, can, can put some of those things in that you might for other behaviors you expect your child to do in other aspects of their life. So I just wanna permission give to parents mm -hmm. that it's okay to parent you know, and, yeah. and put some of those parameters in this context too, and actually can support your child. Sometimes when we take all expectations um, as parents off the table, it's kind of like reassurance, kind of inadvertently communicates to the kid that like, this is something mom and dad are scared about too, um, because they have expectations and limits around my, you know, screen time or around my homework or around, you know, my table manners at the dinner table. But with this, all bets are off. I can do kind of, you know, I can run the show. So it's, it's also okay to that those parameters, even if your child says, I hate this, I hate you for this, actually do create a sense of kind of security, stability, you know, and communicate that confidence and expectation that this is something you know your child can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's such a good answer. I mean, both lovely answers. And I just, I love the giving permission and setting structure and, you know, it's so important. And I think um when considering where you're at remembering that it doesn't what's happening now doesn't have to be always what's happening right so think about where you want to go and even small changes can get you there over time right but i think it's really important when i found when working with parents to also think about their own values and what they want for their child right um and so that's going to differ depending on the child's age but usually like you know, age appropriate independence on things, right? And the fact that, you know, whoever is the preferred parent giving the injection can't always be there, right? Um, needs to also have be able to do things. Um, and so yes, your own values for your own life, but also what do you want for your child over time, right? And when you act consistently with that, that's really rewarding, right? Um, and, it, and it's not a punishment um, for the child. It's actually, it's a fact of life that they, they need, right? And I love the, the sort of security around clear expectations um, and choice that feels okay for the family because what is okay within families differs across families and so you know parents are doing the very best they can um, at any given point and they know their their child the best and they know what's acceptable within their family and what isn't and so what we're here to do is give permission to say like if that's not acceptable in other contexts it doesn't have to be acceptable here mm -hmm. either right <laughs> Um, I'm going to keep you talking, Megan, actually, because we're sort of on the same um, vein, but we actually have not just parents, but youth um, on uh, line as well. And um, one youth uh, shared their own experience that the zero to 10 scale rating, they actually found it really annoying. And it was a, a hard way for them to relate how they were feeling. And I think, you know, you guys have reiterated throughout that you got to kind of make it your own. Mm -hmm. um, but I wondered if you've encountered other useful ranking methods that people have used um, for some ideas for parents. And then also maybe even just like when you're noticing resistance around like probably everyone's going to create their awesome plan and hope their kids are going to love it. Um, but like how to like just keep sensitive to the plan's not working as written and you got to be flexible. Right. Okay. So for the first part, um, I would say, so for 
certainly for younger children, this is a different issue than, and I appreciate what was raised, like so helpful. I'd love to know what they ended up doing, but, um, and so maybe they can put that in the chat, but uh, for younger kids, we often use like a faces scale so that you're pointing to the face rather than having to like grapple with numbers. Um, and there's a free scale um, that's available that's used around fear um, for that. Um, people sometimes use zero to hundred, but what's the point of all this, right? Like, what are we actually trying to do? I think like getting to that, right? So if you want to use colors to indicate like the, the amount of fear, the point is that you're wanting to understand is something like not at all fear inducing a little bit, a medium amount, a lot, or like, oh, I don't even want to think about this. This is so horrifying, right? So however you can kind of order that, perfect. The numbers just get you to that, right? And so then it's like, is it, did it go from say a, I don't know, purple being high to um, maybe black means that it's a lower fear, I don't know, right? So they could come up with a color scheme or whatever it is, but some way of communicating, hey, my fear has gone down, you know, in this situation, right? Um, so that's really kind of what, what matters. Um, and I would love to hear like creative um, options for that. And so, you know, feel free to jump in, um, Katie or Caitlin, if you, if you have other um, ideas there too. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, my, I have a child who has, you know, been in, is in elementary school and they also learn about other things like maybe familiar to some parents, the zones of regulation is, are you in the green zone, the yellow zone or the red zone of emotions, right? Even something as simple as that, you know, getting from the, the red zone is the high fear. Now I'm in the yellow zone, you know, even seeing that change, or I'm now in the green zone, that's calm. Like if your child's using something like that in other areas of their life, also applies here, right? It's just getting, as Megan said, it's just getting at the amount of fear in some way, right? Yeah. I remember and the amount matters because you don't want to throw them in, in the deep end, right? Like this yeah. isn't what used to be called flooding, right? So I'm terrified of spiders. I had a dream about a tarantula like earlier in the week. If I wanted to face my fear around spiders, if I was doing flooding, I would lock myself in a closet with a bunch of tarantulas. That's horrifying. Like that may eventually get my fear down, but like, I wouldn't want to do that to anybody, right? It's too much at once, right? Whereas what we're talking about is sort of smaller steps so that we have to have some way of being able to make those steps and figure out where we should start. And that's what the reading is about. I remember when mom was uh, sharing about her strategies with her teenage son who'd kind of gone into like that teen just kind of grunting stage. <laughs> and she said that, that words were not the right way for them, but they just found like a kind of gradual thumbs up to thumbs down. Perfect. Was something Perfect. That they could do. And he was, you know, happy to give her the thumbs up, thumbs down or in between. So yeah, it's really just finding what, what works for them in the expression of that. Um, Caitlin, uh, a parent had a really good uh, question around the muscle tension technique that you shared, and they were asking about, um, like, how would you describe to a child, maybe they're thinking of a younger child, but like two tenths and release their muscles if they're not familiar with that anatomy and, and that sort of structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I might also um, have Megan jump in with more details um, as well. Um, but I guess the first thing I would think of is, um, you know, I would talk about different ways that the child might kind of already be tense, how they might tense their muscles kind of in day to day or what might be a relatable way um, that they might be doing this in their day to day. So for example, like, flexing your arm and showing me your muscle so that could be a way to kind of teach like okay so that's that's kind of one of the strategies that we're going to use if you're feeling dizzy or if you get nauseous from needles that that's going to be a way that we're going to practice um preventing that or stopping that from happening is to practice like holding that again not in the arm where you get the needle um but also in, um, you could practice imagining with um, tensing your stomach that you can picture yourself kind of walking through a, kind of a fence and there's a narrow um, slit that you're walking through. So you need to really bring in your stomach and tense that stomach um, to, to practice and hold that for a few seconds and then just let it go. And then you alternate um, and with 
with the muscles or you practice with the muscles until that feeling passes. But I'd be curious to know if Megan or Katie, if either you have other ideas around that. Yeah, so it's tricky, right? I think a lot of people have a challenge around this. And so progressive muscle relaxation, which is different, is actually designed to teach us to recognize when we're tense versus relaxed, right? So um, for muscle tension in particular, I might ask them, just like the lemons, actually, I would say, imagine, for example, like squeezing a lemon, that's tense. Now imagine releasing it, but you're not actually dropping the lemon. You're not fully floppy you know, there's still some tension because you have to hold the lemon, right? And I actually, like for a younger child, like, if they were willing, I may actually be like poking a little bit at like the areas that they're tensing versus releasing their muscles. And we may actually go, okay, like show me tension. We can make a game of it. Okay, show me like totally loosey-goosey, relax. Oh, and then like what's in the middle, right? Because it's almost like, how do we understand the baseline or just releasing? It's actually in contrast to the tension versus full relaxing. So like we could use imagery, like cause kids respond well to this, like um, spaghetti. So when we're really tense, we're like the, the uncooked spaghetti. When we're really relaxed, we're like the fully overcooked almost spaghetti. In the middle, then if they're cooks, they might know a little bit about al dente, right? Where it's like a little bit stiff. Um, there's a little bit of something there, but it's not fully one or the other. So I would actually like manipulate their body or like feel uh, their body to practice it kind of beforehand not in any situations related to a needle where they're having that having that issue first just learn the technique in a in a very um like easy sort of situation if that makes sense I love that because I I know what a like hair pulling out situation needles can be for some parents but it's like little ways to almost have fun with it like that was really creative I enjoyed that whole every example I'm like yeah and you can work with your kids to get creative and like try and find those pockets of of fun around what can be like you know a, a really really like you know some families can really really struggle week to week and like finding your way through that with these little techniques are really so amazing um Katie we have a question about um suggestions when it's the medication itself causes the pain. So obviously Humira and um, I know there's biosimilars now that are sanctuary free, but some families still say the medication stings. And um, what are some strategies around that? Yeah, I would say some of the pain management strategies still really apply. And you're right, there are certain medications that it's actually the medication that is, is kind of painful and not the needle itself. Um, but that's where things like distraction can be brilliant for us. Um, distraction is a, a great pain management strategy, not just for needles, but for any type of um, what we call acute pain or short-term pain. Um, and so all those examples that I gave, you know, watching a video, listening to music, um, you know, taking some deep breaths, someone mentioned the virtual reality goggles, you know, like um, having a conversation, like any of those things can be really helpful to just help you ride out that period of time, um, you know, until um, till that, that pain or that stinging sensation goes away. Um, and again, that's one of those pieces where when you talk about it, um, you know, again, the same principles of how you respond as a parent, right? Not saying, oh, this is not going to sting or this is not going to hurt. If it is something that is known about the medication or your child has experienced in the past, instead build that into your coping plan. You know, we know this is a piece of it. Here's why we take these medications, but here's what we're going to do to cope, right? right? Here's what we're going to do to get through it. And, um, you know, building in those, all those other strategies still um, really apply. Uh, we have one last question and then you guys are free to go for the night. Um, because all of our kids grow up and become amazing young adults, I just wanted to ask, do all of these principles apply to self-injection and is there anything you'd add? All of them apply. Um, and I would add that, you know, making a plan for transitioning to self-injection will be really important. So one of the things um, that I probably quickly went through too quickly is that when we're thinking about um, breaking down the situation, creating more steps, I said like, who's giving the injection, right? So actually creating a plan and maybe even kind of, um, you know, a ladder around how are you going to start self-injecting? Now, of course, there's education. There's lots of steps that will kind of be needed in terms of before you're even ready to do that. But if there's fear related to it, 
um, and the knowledge is already there, then um, what we would need is exposures around the kind of self-injection piece as well. But clearly talking to their rheumatology um, healthcare team around anything that is needed to prepare them for that. Um, but all the pain management strategies that we talked about, um, you know, work um, and are helpful. The muscle tension helpful. Um, Exposure-based treatment has been studied um, more in, you know, in adults for sure um, than in, in children. So yeah, absolutely. I'll just add to one of the things I've noticed from working with these youth is some actually like the control that comes with self-injection um, and it actually decreases their distress and fear um, because they have a better sense of uh, I'll say that's not true for everybody, but it is something that I have noticed with some youth, right? That once they get over that initial hurdle, um, actually they much prefer uh, and feel much, um, they just find their distress and their fear is lower. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been amazing. And I'm certain we're going to have some follow-up questions, um, but we just can't thank you enough for your time, for your expertise, and just for being here with our community tonight. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to make a few last remarks, but um, I'm just going to share my screen. Thank um, you so much for having us. It was a real pleasure. I really appreciate it. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so yeah, if you do have any questions after this session, please do feel free to email us at info at cassiamfriends.ca, or you can fill out the form on cassieandfriends.ca, our website, there's a contact form, but um, we do have a medical advisory committee and um, certain um, our amazing panelists tonight um, would also be uh, open to answering a few questions afterwards, because sometimes we later on at night reflect on and just think of a question we didn't have in the moment. Um, I want to just thank one last time our sponsors, um, the Arthritis Society, Nicola Wealth Management, Avi, Amgen, and Sobi. Um, this session really wouldn't be possible, um, our whole virtual education series without them. Um, and also to Solution for Kids in Pain, represented by Dr. Katie Burney tonight. Um, this has been an amazing partnership for Cassie and Friends and really getting those evidence-based solutions, what they're finding out in research right into um, youth and families' hands so that they can put them into practice and and not wait for them. So um, that's been an amazing partnership and it really is transforming uh, kids' pain care across Canada. Um, please keep in touch with Cassie and friends. Um, we talked about all the resources on our website, but if you have ideas or you have something you'd like to share or you'd like to share your story, um, there is all the information on how to contact us uh, here. And we really look forward to hearing from you. Um, lastly, uh, just a reminder about the Facebook group, please feel free to join. There's just an amazing, warm, understanding group of parents there. And some people join and just listen. Some people think they don't have any questions. And then one night about midnight, they have a question, but it really is a, a 24 seven support um, for you in all the stages and ages of your child with rheumatic disease. Lastly, Cassie and Friends is a national organization and we are a charity and we are so pleased to be able to bring these kind of resources to kids and families across Canada. And if you are able, um, a donation is amazing. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, and also uh, please do consider joining Team Cassie and Friends across Canada. So thank you very much. And with that, I will say good night. Um, and it has been wonderful to share the evening with everyone. And I hope you got some amazing strategies tonight. Um, please do fill out the survey and let us know um, how the session was for you. So thank you very much and good night.